So it is a really great pressure, pleasure to have Gus here today. Thank you very much for talking to us. Gus had a big impact on, on me um, in the short amount of time that I've known him mathematically, and I'm very, very interested in what he's got to say today. Over complex K theory. So thank you very much, Gus. All right, thank you very much for introducing me, Jordi. And obviously everyone can see all the uh, thanks I've written up on the page here. Um, I just want to emphasize that I really do feel exceptionally privileged and grateful to be here. So thanks everyone for your help in making this happen. All right, let's get started. So obviously the title of my talk is Geometrics Attack of the KU. So I guess it's a very specific title. Really what I'm trying to advertise is that uh, like we in representation theory should try to work you know, less with cohomology and more with K-theory as much as we can anyway. Um, and maybe there's at least one good motivating example to do that. Before I get onto that, I just want to describe uh, just just go back over some background about what what it mean what I mean when I say we use cohomology in geometric representation theory. So I want to go over the background of the formalism of the constructible generic. So it's uh, it's a datum like a category, but just some data that we attach to let's say complex algebraic varieties that somehow encodes everything we know about the cohomology of our algebraic variety x but but also of all varieties over x and it does so in a very uh, in a highly structured way encoding the cohomology of such things but also relationship between the cohomology of such things and pretty much every fact you knew from sort of the classical study of cohomology of algebraic varieties is somehow packaged up in the theory of constructible derived categories. But, but, but what is the constructible derived category? So uh, at its most basic level, it's a, attached to a complex algebraic variety and some choice of coefficient ring, like K, let's call it, it could be the integers or the rational numbers or something like that. Um, it's just some triangulated category. Okay, it's got a bunch of objects in it, um, on this page, I'm describing two of them in an attempt to, to justify to some extent uh, why I say that this category encodes things about the cohomology of X. So there's, there's two objects, well, there's more than two, but there's at least two objects in this category uh, of interest. There's uh, a unit object called K, if K was the name of our coefficient ring. Um, and there's a dualizing object called omega. So, you know, it's a monoidal category. I'll get to that. These are the units and the dualizing object in, you know, some strong sense. But for now, I'm just calling them the unit and the dualizing object. And we have these, uh, these calculations about HOM sets in this derived category. Um, so I guess I told you it was triangulated. Uh, that means that there's a suspension or a shift endo functor of the constructible derived category. And it's a fact that if I look at the HOM set from the unit object to the shift by i of the unit object, I get out the i cohomology group with coefficients in my coefficient ring. Uh, slightly more esoteric, maybe, statement is that if I look at the dualizing sheaf and look at you know, HOMs from the uh, the unit object to uh, relevant shift of the dualizing object, I can get out, well, I can basically deduce the, uh, I, I guess, uh, the, the borel more homology, or um, you know, I guess what I call it here is the dual of the compactly supported cohomology of X. Um, so, you know, I hope this you know, justifies, at least in some sense, that this category is talking about the cohomology of X. And, and it also encodes some you know, theorems about the cohomology of X. So for example, uh, there's a theorem called Poincaré duality, which is 
a theorem about smooth, well, really about smooth uh, manifolds, but let's just say smooth complex algebraic varieties, uh, and it's encoded in a, in a very simple statement about the constructible derived category written down here, which says that if you have a smooth complex algebraic variety, um, let's say it's connected so it's got a you know well well defined dimension d, then uh, that's com that's complex dimension. Then the uh, the dualizing sheaf is the dualizing object is the two D shift of the constant of the unit object. Uh, and you know if you don't believe me, I guess it's a good ex that, that this is quantum reality. I guess it's a good exercise to go away and figure out why if you put this fact together with the two calculations of concepts that I wrote down, you really do recover Poincaré duality. So, you know, you probably don't need me to tell you, but, uh, you know, there's a good reason to want to package up everything and all the cohomology and everything you know about cohomology of some variety in, in this way. Uh, basically, this gadget that I'm talking about forms the basis for a great many uh, statements of deep theorems in, in algebraic geometry and geometric representation. Okay, so let's move on. I'm going to give you another example of something about cohomology that's encoded in the constructible derived category. So we have our uh, long exact sequences associated to closed subvarieties of algebraic varieties um, in the cohomology uh, supported on the, the comparing basically the cohomology of um, the, the the ambient variety, the cohomology of the complement and the cohomology of the ambient variety supported on the closed subvariety. Um, you know, it's just one of the first things that you learn when you learn about uh, cohomology in the algebraic topology class. Um, and the claim is that, you know, this is also encoded somehow in, well, in a very precise way in a statement about the constructible derived category. Namely, there's, there's a couple more objects uh, associated to this closed embedding which I've deigned to denote, uh, well, if you just look at this exact triangle, um, the thing that I claim to be an exact triangle here, uh, it goes from I lower exclamation mark and I to the power exclamation mark, if you like, K, etc. So, so that's pronounced uh, I lower shriek, I upper shriek, K. It maps to K, and that maps to J lower star, J upper star, K. I mean, there's other ways to pronounce that, but that's why I pronounce it. Um, the point is, there's a couple more objects associated to I and J in this uh, constructible derived category, and they form a triangle. It's a triangulated category. They form an exact triangle, um, which I've written down below. And you know these these objects that I've written the I lower shriek I upper shriek K represents um, well, I don't know if represents is the right, right word but you know it, it I guess so it represents um, the cohomology of X supported on the closed subvariety Z in the sense that Hans out of the unit object to it. Uh, with the appropriate shift giving you precisely that cohomology group. Um, and this J lower star, J upper star K is some object in the constructible derived category which, which represents, in the same sense, um, the cohomology of the, uh, of the X variety called U. And that's just some triangle in the constructible derived category such that when I get the long exact sequence, uh, from it, given by applying Homs out of the unit object, I recover this classical Davisage long exact sequence. Um, so that's you know, just really another example of a couple more objects that are in this category. 
uh, and how how they give you some other fact uh, from you know the classical theory of cosmology. Um, and I guess it's it's no accident that I wrote those two objects uh, in this way: I low shriek, I, I upper shriek, K, and J lower star, J upper star, K. Those, there are actually functors. Um, well, I won't say exactly uh, what I lower shriek and I upper shriek separately are for now, um, but for now I'll just say that they're Composition is some endofunctor of the constructible derived category of X, and likewise the composition of J lower star and J upper star. And for any object replacing K, I'll get a triangle like that. So, you know, this, this theorem, I mean, this, I guess, the, the statement of the existence of such a triangle, um, and that you could substitute for K any other object of the constructible derived category, is some hint, at least, that. Uh, kind of it, even though this category, I, I say it's just really encoding statements about cohomology, it's kind of a bit stronger than that. It gives you it gives you more besides. Um, you know, so I guess it gives you functoriality in a maybe a more manageable way than you would ordinarily have had just working with cohomology. So Gaston's question is basically like. Um... Is Poincaré duality valid for compactly supported homology? Yeah, it's well, it's a statement about that. the The point is that basically you've got a pairing between co homology and compactly supported co homology in complementary degrees if your variety is smooth. A first statement of Poincaré duality you come across might not might be for compact. Spaces, in which case they wouldn't talk about compactly supported cohomology, but but it is a statement relating cohomology and compactly supported cohomology. So let's move on. Okay, so yeah, the full power. I don't know. I'm not willing to back this up, but just a catchphrase. The full power of the constructible derived category. Uh, of x with coefficients in our ring k comes from varying x. Um, so the point here is that not only do we have for every x this triangulated category uh, called the constructible derived category of x, but also we have a bunch of interesting uh, functors between them. Basically, asso so associated to every uh, homomorphism of algebraic varieties, you get four functors, so two two adjoint pairs of functors, the uh, the star pair and the shriek pair, um, which map back and forth between the constructible derived categories of the two varieties that are linked by this function. Well. In, in particular, in the case of embeddings, we've we've already at least written down some of these functors. These these do recover the functors that I described on the previous slide um, for for constructing the Debussy long exact sequence. Um, but anyway, we've got these two uh, two adjoint pairs of functors satisfying a bunch of relations, which I will describe on the next page. So, you know, if, if this is new to you, if this is not new to you, then, you know, nothing I've said so far is new to you. If this is new to you, um, you know, it's kind of bewildering at first, but the main thing you have to bear in mind is just that um, most everything that's written here really does correspond to some some statement you could make about cohomology. Maybe it's a bit stronger than that statement, but it basically corresponds to that. Uh, so let's go through the list. Uh, these functors are themselves functors in some sense. Basically, all that really means is that if I compose to S and then take the corresponding, you know, 
uh, lower star, upper star, lower shape, upper shape functor, um, it's the same as composing uh, the same named functor associated to the two factors of my uh, map of algebraic varieties. Um, F upper star is monoidal. This is basically, uh, in terms of cohomology, just something like the cohomology group is, is a ring. Um, uh, the, the dualizing object that I talked about before has actually a uh, simple description in terms of these functors. It's just uh, the upper shriek functor from a point. However, I feel like this is kind of circular reasoning because, you know, now, now, now you know that you don't know what the dualizing object is and you don't know what the upper shriek functor is, but at least you know that, you know, your lack of knowledge is kind of equivalent between those two in some sense. I will actually come back to this point. The, in the context of, uh, so when, when I first learned about the dualizing object, I was terribly confused. I tried to, I read up about uh, Verdier reality and all that, and all I could understand was basically, it's just defined by this formula. So you have to know what the upper shriek functor is. Actually, there's a much better description of it. Um, but it's kind of hard to state uh, in terms of classical constructions. We'll get to it when, when we do slightly less classical constructions. Um, but, but anyway, there is some description of this dualizing object in terms of the upper shriek. It's written here. There's a, a Verdier duality functor, which is um, really just uh, the internal home functor to the dualizing object, but it, it intertwines um, the upper stars and the upper shrieks and the lower stars and the lower shrieks, which is a very useful fact. Um, so this is a kind of relative Poincaré duality statement that I've written down. If F is smooth of relative dimension D, then um, this upper shriek functor is basically the same as this upper, upper star functor up to a shift. Uh, I guess th this combined with the statement about uh, a, a construction of the dualizing object uh, will reduce to the Poincaré duality statement I made before. So that's why this is a relative Poincaré duality statement. Um, we have uh, an identification, the lower star and the lower shriek are the same if F is proper. Um, this is in terms of cohomology, corresponds to the very stupid statement that uh, the compactly supported cohomology of a compact space is the same as its cohomology. Um, and there's another thing called proper base change. I'm actually not going, it's just some very useful formula um, talking about what happens when you have a uh, a fiber product of algebraic varieties, there's sort of two different push-pull ways to go around it, mixing up shrieks and stars in the way I've written here. And um, the statement is that they are the same. So you know you can sort of play around if the if the base point, if the um, the variety over which the fiber product is taken is the point, you know, you can try and figure it out what this might be in terms of cohomology, but I'm not going to make a concrete statement there. But basically, and, and this is pretty much it, we've got all of these functors, um, this together, the, what's written here together with the Devisage triangle that I wrote down before tells you, I don't, I, actually I'd love, I'd be very happy to stand corrected if someone could tell me that I've that I've missed something, but I feel like this tells you uh, pretty much all you need to know in terms of uh, formalism to do a bunch of calculations with the uh, the constructible derived category. This is what's called the six functor formalism that I'm presenting here. Um, and 
I don't know, maybe there's even a, a sense in which the constructible derived category is universal for having a six front um, But I, I wouldn't like to make a strong statement along those lines. The point is, we've got this formalism, we've got these triangulated categories, we've got all these functions, it's all very well behaved, but in some sense, kind of everything corresponds to a statement about cohomology. Um, and basically all, all the proofs of all of these facts also boil down to statements about cohomology when you really get into the, uh, the nuts and bolts of it. Okay, are there any... The uh, Lin Wan just pointed out that there's a typo in the fifth point. One, two, three, four, five. Yes. Okay, thank you, Jordi. So, likewise, doesn't make much sense at the beginning of the fifth point. The, the typo is that F lower, sh so F lower shriek should be intertwined with F lower star. That's the statement. here. But in any case, that fact is a consequence of, I guess I didn't say that the Verdier duality is um, self-adjoint in, in some sense, but it is. And uh, that likewise statement, or at least the proper likewise statement, follows from messing around with the junctions from the statement of the fourth bullet point. Although that's not how you prove it. But all of these things sit, sit together. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? I guess an obvious question is uh, what the other two functors are, uh, since you called it a six-functor formalism and then uh, only talked about four functors. Ah, right. So I'm actually not sure. Now, I'm sure that people know, but this always confused me. There's another functor called um, Verdier duality. There's another functor on top of these four. There's also an internal Hong functor, and there's also an... Uh, external tensor product functor. I suppose that the other two functors must, mm, and there's also a tensor product functor, you know, and like if you take at least two of those, you can construct the other two. So I don't really know what the canonical six are. Maybe you can tell me. I would have said it was um, internal HOM and left to right tensor product. And, and the, the tensor product? Yeah. I, I didn't catch that. Yeah, okay. I said that F star is monoidal. I didn't say that the derived category was monoidal. I suppose I should have, otherwise it doesn't make much sense. I think you did. Um, oh, I did? Yeah, so given that it's monoidal, it has a tensor product functor. Um, and there's also an internal home functor that I've alluded to, even if I haven't written it down. And um, Verdier duality is related to the internal harm in that it's just internal harm to the dualizing object. That's why it's called the dualizing object, I suppose. There's also a pretty useful functor. Um, it's used quite a lot called the external tensor product functor. If you've got a product of two varieties um, and objects of the constructible derived categories of both, then you can tensor them externally together to get an object of the derived, constructible derived category of their product. And this is a, uh, this is a functorial uh, or bifunctorial operation, I guess. Um, but it can just be constructed in terms of pullbacks and tensor products. Pullbacks meaning upper star functors. So it doesn't, it doesn't make the, the list. Okay, any other questions? Just a general comment um, to support Gus's um, kind of unsurety with the six functors. Because I always find it a bit of a red herring that we think that there's um, lower shriek, lower star, upper, upper shriek, upper star, hom, and tensor, because there's really two tensors. There's, yeah. um, and I don't know, the fact that I'm not aware, like, that I wasn't aware of that there's two tensors was kind of um, like led me down some blind alleys. So, um, just, right. I think the same thing happened to me when, when I was writing paper two. That's why sometimes I feel like we should advocate for the external tensor product replacing the tensor product because you can recover the tensor product 
by doing external product onto x squared and then restriction on the diagonal. And then the other product is just the shriek restriction on the diagonal. And it seems like there's no reason to prefer one over the other, but we do apparently. Anyway, there's one other thing to say about this constructible garage category, which is, you know, not, not only does it have all of this very, very neat and highly computable formalism, but it also has these amazing objects inside it called perverse sheaves. Well, th there's other interesting objects besides, but basically, I guess the, the, the first really interesting kind of new object that was discovered in, inside the constructible uh, derived category is, uh, is called a perverse sheaf. And, you know, the, these are just some objects which, I don't know, you, you'd, you'd never have found them if you just were messing around with cohomology. You really need this formalism and this, you know, this somewhat technical category. You need to play around with it. You need to you really use um, all, these, all these different functors. And then at some point you discover these amazing objects called perverse sheaves. Um, and the reason why they're amazing is that, well, you know, they, they, there's all sorts of fantastic things about them. They, uh, uh, they form a really, really well-behaved subcategory. Um, they are reasonably amenable to computation. And they just, I don't know, they, they seem to be the right thing to consider. I don't know if there's a good philosophical reason for that, but they just are the right thing to consider if you want to prove a load of really interesting results uh, in representation theory. So, okay, that's, I don't know. The, the, these objects are probably really the best adverse system for learning about when using the constructible derived category. Um, so the big question that I have, and I'm certainly far from the first person to have asked that question, uh, is you know, given that this constructible derived category was somehow just talking about Ultimately, like it was really just talking about cohomology, but in some really souped up, sophisticated way. Um, you know, could, couldn't I do the same thing? Like, just get some other category where instead of cohomology, it was K theory. You know, all, all those theorems about cohomology that are encoded, in fact, about the constructible derived category. Are also theorems of K theory, or that uh, have analogous theorems of K theory. So couldn't I just, you know, make a K theoretic version, and then having done so, couldn't I, you know, find some more amazing objects in in the resulting category, perverse sheets or something like that? And then if I did that, couldn't I just take every single theorem in geometric representation theory that uses the uh, the constructible derived category and prove some some new theorem. Um, sometimes, it, I mean, so, some new theorem and often entirely predictable theorem actually, um, given the the, the cohomological version. Could, you know, it, it would be a fantastic thing to have. I think you know if if it if we had it and it was on a very firm footing, then basically you could pretty much just sweep over. You know, half of the history of geometric representation theory and just churn out new results. It would be fantastic. Um, so anyway, that, that's the big question. Uh, well, I'm, you know, I, I'm introducing some new notation for this category right here. Um, you know, I, I see no need to like, massively change the notation we had before. Before we had dcx of k, where k was, you know, our ring, uh, the integers, or the rationals, or something like that. Uh, let's just replace it by this symbol ku, 
and let's that denote this uh, imagined amazing category. Um, so I guess the, the next thing that I want to do is actually give you a concrete example of a, of a great theorem from representation theory, from geometric representation theory that was proved about uh, you know, one example of a constructible derived category and say what we would hope uh, the, the theorem about this other object would, would say. Um, but before I get on and give that specific example, this maybe it's good to clarify that you're always talking about topological k theory here. Thank you, Jordi. So um, there's something called algebraic k theory, which is more complicated for the most part anyway, typically more complicated than anything that I'm proposing here uh, and anything that I will propose by the end of the talk. However, uh, I think it's, you know, it's true that some of the things that I'm going to talk about are related to things that you could say about algebraic K-theory. Uh, in maybe in a fruitful way, I don't know. But yeah, basically you don't really have to worry about algebraic K-theory. We're just talking about topological K-theory. Um, you know, the, the fact that I'm working with an algebraic variety rather than just like a top, topological space or maybe an analytic, complex analytic space or whatever, it's just uh, mostly irrelevant, but there are probably some times where it's not like, in, not incredibly essential for this. Okay, so I want to explain this uh, this really motivating specific example, um, but unfortunately, first I have to make a detour because it's about equivariant derived categories. So I'll, I'll try and make this somewhat brief for now. Um, but yeah, first I need to take this detour. So let me just say that if I've got an algebraic group G acting on my variety X, um, then you know, there's a concept of uh, equivariant cohomology which has several descriptions, but one of them is just that, you know, if you think of X as a topological space with an action in the topological group G, then you can form something called the Borel construction, which is some sort of homotopy theoretic quotient of X by G. And that's just some new topological space, or I guess properly it's really just a homotopy type, but it doesn't matter for taking cohomology um, and that's the equivariant cohomology. And the, the, the point is that, you know, well, I guess the, the narrative is that anything about cohomology uh, is also a thing about the constructible derived category. And, you know, the narrative holds in this instance. There's, a, there's an equivariant version of the constructible derived category. Um, Notated uh, in this way, we just stick an extra G down in the subscript of the of the D, and this encodes things, you know, about equivariant cohomology of uh, you know X G equivariant X varieties, and um, you know it it is to the equivariant cohomology of the equivariant X varieties as the ordinary constructible derived category is to the cohomology of X varieties. It has a six functor formalism. Um, and basically, you know, it, it's a little bit more technical, but at the end of the day, uh, it pretty much works the same way as the uh, as the regular, the ordinary constructible derived category. Now, there's also a notion of geocovariant k theory, and you know we can we can hope that there's a uh, that I mean, we we don't even I haven't even 
proposed a k-theoretic version of the constructible derived category. But, you know, supposing that we could do that, we can also hope that we can make an equivariant version, which is to equivariant k-theory as, uh, you know, the, uh, the regular k-theoretic derived category is to the k-theory of varieties over x. Okay, so, so we'll assume that that exists, everything works out, you know, I'll, I'll come back to issues with this later, but let's just assume that we have also an equivariant version. Um, okay, so finally on to uh, something to do with uh, geometric satake, which was in my in the title of my talk, so I'm glad I made it here after only 45 minutes. Sp speaking of which, let's break right now. Welcome back, us. Thank and you. Welcome back, everyone else. I just want to go through a uh, an example of something um, that's you know some really wonderful statement in geometric representation theory uh, that uses the constructible derived category and state, well, give a definitely incorrect, but roughly correct statement of the, uh, you know, the analogous theorem that ought to hold with the k-theoretic drive category and, some evidence, and explain that there's some evidence that, that's, that that really does hold. Okay, so the, the wonderful theorem is geometric satake, or actually, as I'm presenting it here, derived geometric satake. So, associated to an algebraic group, complex algebraic group, reductive, what to say, yeah. Associated to a reductive complex algebraic group G, uh, there's some big complicated algebraic variety, let's call it, uh, called the affine Grassmannian. Uh, it's got an action of some loop group associated to G, uh, but you know, I guess the exact, the exact definition of these things is not extremely important. Um, but the point is that if you consider its equivariant constructible derived category for uh, basically, well, what's written as L plus G here, but um, it's at least in terms of is basically the G equivalent drug category, but with fewer objects. Uh, the point is that we've got some algebraic varieties, some complicated group acting on it, and if we look at the equivariant constructible derived category for that, it's equivalent to some purely algebraic thing, which is already uh, you know, a nice fact. And then the description of that purely algebraic thing is what's really amazing. Uh, it's constructed out of the Langlands dual group. Um, so I guess I'm kind of glossing over the choice of coefficients here. Um, and I guess I'm also kind of glossing over the status of this theorem. But um, in, in any case, the statement is that for any choice of almost any choice of coefficients that you care to think of k, there's a Langlands dual, the Langlands dual group has a form over that ring, which doesn't appear in the notation. Um, but there's this Langlands dual group. And uh, the, the purely algebraic description of this category is I consider the Lie algebra of this Langlands dual group I take its symmetric, so uh, just as a vector space to start with, I take its, uh, its the, I take the commutative ring it generates, its symmetric algebra, viewed as a DG algebra with the generators in degree two. Um, so that's some DG algebra with an action of the Langlands dual group, and I can consider coherent sheaves, and it, but you know, ba basically, it's it's just a, a 
the, the, the Wiener functions on some vector space, you know, may, maybe you don't have to worry so much about this differential um, and that it vanishes, but just know it's there. Basically, it's just doing the functions on some vector space, the, the dual of the, the algebra of the Langlands dual root. And I can look at uh, Langlands dual root equivariant coherent shoes on that uh, space, or sim, if you like, uh, modules for its ring of functions that are equivalent with respect to uh, this language dual group. So that's just some purely algebraic category. It's a triangulated category. Uh, and, you know, it's just equivalent to this topological gadget for this dual group. It's amazing. Um, moreover, and I guess this is where uh, maybe the, the need for perverse sheaves might come in, is that, um, so, so these, these magical objects on the left-hand side correspond to the sort of the obvious objects on the right-hand side, where you just take a representation of the language dual group and uh, view it as a free sheaf on, it, on its, um, uh, on, well, if you like, a free object, uh, free, module for the symmetric uh, algebra of the Lie algebra just by tensoring with it. Um, and, you know, that's going to have a action of, that, that tensor product will have a diagonal action of the Langlands dual group. And it's sort of, I don't know, the obvious way to construct an object of the right-hand side, but they correspond to these magical objects on, on the left-hand side. And I guess, you know, maybe it's no surprise that the, I mean, that, it's a, that's, that's two things. That's an illustration of the correctness of perverse sheaves uh, as, as you know, interesting objects on the left-hand side, but also it's a technical reason to want to have them because the proof of this inevitably goes by some analysis of the perverse sheaves in the left-hand side. Um, okay, and there's, you know, there's kind of a souped-up version of this a theorem where we throw in an extra group which acts, uh, C star acts by quote unquote loop rotation on the affine Grassmannian that we constructed. Um, and what happens? Well, I guess you should, ex you should always expect that when you're throwing in a, uh, a C star action, you end up getting a one parameter deformation of the result. That's just because the equivariant cohomology of C star um, is functions on the affine line. And indeed you do get a one parameter deformation. You get this Reese uh, algebra of the universal enveloping algebra coming. Okay, so anyway, uh, I guess the first statement is already pretty amazing. And then the fact that uh, loop rotation equivalence switches on this uh, you know, PBW business on the right hand side. On, on the right hand side is just fantastic. Anyway, those are the statements. They are definitely true if k is uh, q. I guess I don't know actually what the status of them is um, for for an arbitrary um, ring here, but. Um, the, the equivalence on the level of perverse she, the subcategory of perverse she is corresponding to what I said it corresponds to, is known for almost all, all, all reasonable K. Um, and that's the actual geometric Satake theorem due to Merkovich and Bruno. Okay. Um, fine. So, so that's the, that's, that's the derived geometric Satake theorem. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, it's, it's complicated, but if you restrict to a chunk of the left-hand side, I guess I was, um, I guess I call it a chunk of the right-hand side. But basically, there's a large chunk of both sides of these categories. 
um, that also correspond to each other, and such that the corresponding chunk, large chunk of the left-hand side is something that sort of can be, like that, that category can just be described directly in terms of um, something called the convolution algebra of borel moore homology, of some fairly uh, re relatively simple complex algebraic varieties. So there's a paper from a few years ago uh, by Cortis and Kamnitzer where they, uh, they said, okay, you know, we've got these, we've got this fantastic theorem, we've got these large chunks of both sides which do correspond and which on the left-hand side we can really just describe the whole category just in terms of, uh, a for, like formally in terms of a bunch of objects and home sets being some the cohomology of some varieties, the equivariant cohomology of some varieties that we know. So you know, we like for that for that chunk, we there's sort of an obvious this ad hoc way to make a k-theoretic version um, where we just switch out each home space which has a description as the equivariant cohomology of some variety for its equivalent FK theory. So they, they did that. They got some, uh, some new perfectly well-defined category. Uh, and you know, they studied it and were able to, and, and it's some pure top, topological thing, but they were able to relate it to um, something to do with the Langmans dual group, uh, but that was related to the quantum group and the quantum function algebra rather than um, like the, 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 the Lie algebra and the universal enveloping algebra. Um, so, you know, I guess I'm not going to exactly spell out their result, um, but it is roughly consistent with the following conjecture, which, which I put up is definitely false, but is probably true subject to some minor caveats here. Or there. Um, so the quantum geometric Satake, or maybe I should have called it quantum derived geometric Satake conjecture, because it's really a K theoretic or on one side and quantum on the other side, analog of the derived geometric Satake theorem that I wrote down before, says that uh, basically if we swap out our previous ring K for KU on the left-hand side, oh, there's another typo here, by the way, which I'll come to in a second, but just focus on the first bullet point. It says that if I take the same algebraic variety, the same group acting, but swap out my constructible derived category for this imagines k-theoretic analog, then on the right-hand side, uh, it's, well, pre previously it, it was um, Langmans dual group equivariant coherent sheaves on the uh, Langmans dual Lie algebra. Now it's just Langmans dual group equivariant coherent sheaves on the Langmans dual group for the conjugation. Um, and the typo is that the second bullet point was supposed to have that C star thrown in as an equivariant uh, subscript to D. But the point is that the, you know, when you switch on loop rotation, previously this corresponded to replacing the Lial, like the symmetric algebra of the Lie algebra with its universal enveloping algebra. And that was this one parameter deformation with uh, this H parameter. Here we should be getting out uh, the quantum function al uh, algebra of the Langmans dual group, which is basically, uh, I mean, it's kind of dual to the, quant the, the quantum group. It's, it's something very much related to the, uh, the, the quantum group. And, you know, Q here is a one parameter uh, I, you know, is a, it, it, this is also one parameter deformation, but this time Q is invertible. Q is replacing, replacing H. It's invertible now, and it as it should be, uh, as we expect from quantum group theory. 
uh, and it corresponds to the equivariant K, the, the C star equivariant K theory of a point. Um, so, you know, if we had a theorem like that, it would be absolutely fantastic. And my, my claim is that, you know, subject to some tweaks in the statement here, um, you know, if, if you had left-hand side categories and, you, and they sort of work the same way as um, the constructible derived category with regard to functoriality, then you'd be able to uh, recover the cortis kamnitzer statement by restricting to the same subchunks that they restrict to. You sort of turn the formalism crank and you'd get out from, from this left-hand side, you'd get out the home groups that they sort of manually inserted. And, you'd, and the statement that I've written here, the sub-chunk of the right-hand side is you know, the, the category that they found that was indeed equivalent to their like, manually ad hoc constructed category. So that, that's why I say that this is kind of consistent with their um, theorem. And it has come to my attention that Ben Elias and Jordi Williamson have recently been performing some, uh, some other calculations that I think they've gone further than Cortis and Kamritsa went, um, which are providing more evidence for this conjecture or at least one very much like it. Um, I, it seems a little bit absurd, doesn't it, to say that we have evidence for a conjecture where I haven't even told you what the left-hand side means, but the point is that whatever it means, you should be able to, like we can at least say what some of these objects would be and what some of its home spaces would be, just like by analogy with um, the, the constructible divide category. So I don't know if that- Can you, can you explain case, what the right-hand side is, Gus? The right hand side. You know, like you're asking what, what I mean when I say the right hand side. You're asking me to explain these right hand sides. These right hand sides. What what the cat? What the definition of the category is? Ah, so you know, there's. Um, so for the first one, there's a ring called uh, function, you know, algebraic functions on the Langlands dual group, um, and. You're supposed to view this as a Z mod two graded DG algebra, um, and you can you know consider Langlands dual group equivariant DG modules for that DG algebra, and I suppose uh, technically what the right hand side here is supposed to be is the um, the triangulated subcategory of that. DG, the, the DG subcategory of that DG category generated by those objects which are of the form um, functions on the Langlands dual group tensored with a representation of the Langlands dual group. Okay, yeah, thanks. Sorry, um, and that's, um, can I ask like uh, a question? What field is G over? And like the follow up is like, what is the Langlands dual? If we're working over, like, if we're really working over KU, then what's the Langlands dual? Ah, so I suppose, um, as stated here, the answer would be that G, uh, the Langlands dual is the Langlands dual over the integers. So I'm going to explain this more, but both of these categories are Z linear. There's no KU linearity. Um, and that's because, so the, the left-hand category will end up being the homotopy category of some KU linear infinity category. And this is just a statement about its homotopy category, which is some triangulated category, um, which would only be linear over the homotopy groups of KU. So it would only be Z linear. So even though KU appears uh, as a symbol in the left-hand side, nothing here is KU linear, 
And this would all just be Z linear, it would be the, the Langmans dual group over Z. Um, now, I don't know, maybe there'll be some torsion issues. And technically, to get a valid statement like this, we'd have to localize out by a few primes or something like that. I don't, I, I don't exactly know. Um, there are other tweaks that you would definitely need to get it in to, to get it to be correct. Like Jordi told me, for example, that you really need to work with a twisted F on guess what I mean. Um, there may be another tweak to do with having to take a um, finite flat, uh, like to ten tensoring o over a finite flat covering of the representation ring or something like that. I mean, Probably there's, in the end, there'll be a very neat way to state this, and this is not it. But basically, something like this is true. There's also, actually, this is one of the things that I would, um, so I've got another section where I propose actual construction of these categories. I've got a final section where I talk about, uh, like, I have a long list of um, ideas and observations, and one of them is what the actual KU linear statement here should be. So the you know the the actual KU linear version of the left hand side, where we you know that we got before we took its homotopy category, ought also to correspond to something purely algebraic, um, and you know, I have a notion what it might be, and it, and it will involve you know a Langland's dual form over over Ku, um, which you know, sure, I'm, I'm sure it, it exists. Uh, there's some root data, root data, like probably over any spectrum, given some root data, you could get a algebraic group. I think that statement is uh, suspicious. Yeah. You know, I, I, I like um, so. Luri explained to me that to lift a to lift an algebra to you know a general spectrum re requires that the algebra is of a very special form, which um, functions on groups which aren't tori are not. So, are you saying that there's no hope for any uh, non-discrete spectrum to um, have a version of the group acting upon it? My understanding was that if you want to, I mean, like, I don't know, you know, I don't understand this well, but my understanding is, you know, you have something like HZ and then you have yes. the sphere spectrum and then you have a whole lot of spectra in between. Yeah. Um, and somehow, like, the further you want to lift your algebra up, um, the more constraints it puts on your algebra. So, for example, if you lift all the way up the sphere spectrum, then this implies that your algebra has lifts of Frobenius for all p, uh -huh. um, which you know almost no algebra, no algebra over Z has. But I'm not sure what the constraints are for lifting to Ku. Um. Hmm. Right, but in any case, it seems so. I'm not sure we need the ring of functions on it. I mean, isn't there just a Clearly, in the category of KU modules, let's say, you can form a free K mod KU module of rank N and consider it's, it's GL. And that will be some algebraic group that will correspond to some algebraic group in, uh, you know, well, I, anyway, I, I don't want to get into it. But, but, but it's what I, what I want to say is that whatever statement I propose, it doesn't involve directly writing like function like this O or OQ or anything like that. All you need is the, the group in some appropriate sense. You know, it would just be like some object of uh, infinity stacks on K new algebras. Okay. Sheaves of spectra. Um, so you know it turns out that if you're willing to uh, believe in spectra and use spectra and understand spectra, which I don't know well enough, but nonetheless, I'm, I think I understand them well enough to believe that what I'm about to say is true. Um, then basically, there's a pretty simple definition of what this 
k-theoretic constructible graph category is. Um, so, you know, I never actually described the construction of the, um, the constructible graph category. I've, I've never said it had anything to do with sheaves on X, but, but it does. Um, the standard construction is you, you have a category of sheaves of K, that's lowercase k modules on our algebraic variety X. Um, and basically you, you just take its derived, that's an abelian category, and you take its derived category, and then you pass to some, some, some objects which are called constructors. But uh, the kind of annoying thing for me anyway about that statement is that in the end, the object, what, what the objects are is they're just, they're complexes of sheaves on X. Um, and, you know, we did some localization procedure, but nonetheless, the objects are just complexes of, some complexes of sheaves on X. But there's no real sense in which they are uh, sheaves. Um, and, you know, that they're not could be basically proven by some sort of, de I mean, just, just take some algebraic variety with non-trivial cohomology and cover it with um, subsets that do have trivial cohomology. And you'll just see that, like, uh, there's no way in which you could deduce some interesting element of some HOM group on the big thing from homes of, of uh, its restrictions to the subset. So there's just no real way in which, at least on this triangulated level, we're actually looking at, it's built out of sheaves, but the objects themselves are not really sheaves. But there's a way to make them so, which is that um, instead of working with K, you switch perspectives. I mean, it's basically still K at the end of the day, but there's a spectrum associated to K called the Eilenberg and Plane spectrum, um, which is some commutative ring in the symmetric model of the category spectra. And, you know, I can just, it makes sense to consider sheaves of HK modules on X. Um, and that's, you know, that's some new stable infinity category uh, whose homotopy category is just equivalent to uh, the derived category of sheaves of K modules. On X. And you know, whatever definition of constructible object we had before just makes sense basically in, a, in exactly the same way for sheaves of HK modules. Um, but we don't have to do any nasty localization procedure. We can just directly consider sheaves of HK modules on X. And that already gives us you know, an enhancement in the sense of, um, you know, Infinity, uh, in, uh, in, its, in the sense of stable infinity categories of the, derived, the constructible derived category of X. Um, it's, you know, in many ways it's actually like, just better than the derived category, the constructible derived category of X. There's this thing with the object actually just directly being sheaves, which I really like. Um, there's also a uh, Maybe the nicest thing about it, or my, my favorite thing about it, is that there's a really, really neat description of the um, of the dualizing complex, which is just that. Uh, I mean, I guess may, maybe you could have said this already on the triangulated category level, but it makes more sense here. Which is that all the dualizing complexes from this perspective is, well, it's a sheaf of HK modules on X. It's the sheaf which associates to any open sub-variety, let's say, or I guess other analytic subset, any open subset U. Um, the smash product of HK with the one-point compactification of U, thought of as a homotopy, uh, as a pointed homotopy type. Um, that's that's a sheaf, believe it or not. Um, it's actually maybe a good exercise to like 
work out, at least in some simple cases, why that really is a sheaf, and that's the dualizing object. I like it. Um, anyway, so you know, there's absolutely no problem once you get to grips somewhat with spectra in uh, and infinity categories and what have you with defining this category. Maybe my notation is somewhat backwards here. Yeah? By HD, I mean the stable infinity category, and then just by D, I'll mean its homotopy category. That might be backwards, but I introduced the notation D first, and there was no reason to have an H there. That's why it's this way around. Um, and there's a six functor formalism for it, which works sort of in exactly the same way that you would expect. And basically, any time that there was a statement arising out of the six functor formalism for the, con the constructible derived category that was about cohomology, there will be an analogous thing you can write down involving the six functor formalism here that will boil down to the analogous statement for K3. Um, so it definitely exists. And, uh, you know, there's all sorts of ways, I think, to prove it. Um, but there's a, uh, there's a dumb way to prove it, which is that uh, basically, you know, Morel Vyvodsky did something to do with uh, to do with motives, but basically they constructed a six functor formalism for uh, well she sheaves of spectra just o just over the sphere spectrum um, for you know, on on some complicated site associated to an algebraic variety and just holds. There is a six functor formalism, and what I'm proposing here could just be got out by some uh, some realization procedure which carries a six functor formalism over. Now that's, you know, that's a terrible proof, uh, and there's definitely a more direct proof that would also extend to like an analytic spaces, complex analytic spaces um, that just doesn't use algebra and works directly there. But at least you know. This is an incontrovertible proof, and nobody could say that it doesn't exist. Um, and probably the, the quickest proof that, that I know, since I haven't actually seen a direct, more direct proof that you know. Um, okay, so, okay, that's the absurd but short proof. Um, there's also an equivariant version, which we're going to need. Uh, and I just wanted to like talk about some potential issues with that. So. The, the usual definition that I know about of the equivariant constructible derived category is essentially, well, it's due to Bernstein and Lundson, it's essentially a Borel method definition. And we could use that um, also for the K-theoretic version, but we'll end up um, you know, not having the representation ring appearing as uh, coefficients, but rather but rather its completion. And for some purposes, maybe we don't want to work with its completion. In particular, um, you know, working with the Borel version and getting the completion uh, from one perspective should amount to kind of a, a simplification of this category. And there's another simplification where we work rationally. And if you take both simplifications together, you will just end up with nothing new. There'll, there'll be a term character isomorphism between this equivariant rationalized k-theoretic constructible derived category and just the uh, regular equivariant constructible derived category um, to, to periodicized. So you know we don't want to do both simplifications, we want to do one or the other. Um, and that's just something to bear in mind. So I think that there's a like a definition that I just want to throw out there um, of the equivariant k-theoretic derived category, which really, uh, which really keeps the representation ring as parameters and doesn't complete it. So the statement is to consider x mod g as an algebraic stack or an analytic stack if we're working the analytic setting or whatever. 
um, consider the site whose objects are just smooth objects over that and whose covers are isovariant et al. coverings. Isovariant et al. coverings are those which um, on the level of the functor of points, remember uh, the, um, the, the points of some algebraic stack is a form of groupoid. And a morphism is isovariant if the, for, every, uh, for every affine variety mapping in, the corresponding uh, morphism of groupoids on the level of points is fully faithful. Uh, so like, this is always going to be true if there's no stackiness because they're just sets. Um, and, and if you think of a set as a category with uh, you know, only identity morphisms and, on objects, then you know, any map of sets is, is fully faithful. Um, but it's not so for groupoids, and you know, isovariant means that it'd be fully faithful. But the, the point of considering um, this particular category, oh, and then we will just take sheaves of KV modules in this category. The, the point of considering that is that when you look at point mod G, um, basically everything in the associated site for that can be covered by things of the form an, an affine space, time, or I guess I, guess I should say, yeah, and basically an affine space times um, an, an orbit mod G. Um, and the reason why that's sort of the right thing to consider is that, well, if we look at sheaves on this category, uh, and maybe we restrict to those which are constants along affine spaces, then we're just left on pre, with pre sheaves on the orbit category, which is sort of exactly the right thing to consider to get this kind of genuine equivariance from the perspective of genuine equivariant homotopy theory. So uh, th there is a perspective from which this seems like the right thing to consider. Um, and, you know, I, I think we get some interesting. Uh, stable infinity category out of it, which sort of computes the right thing, the right equivariant homology that we'd expect it to. What I'm not sure of is that whether we ha really do have a six functor formalism for that. I mean, I'm certain that it's true, but I can't, I can't prove it because, um, I mean, there are some technical issues. Um, so basically, the uh, there's been some work done in this direction, um, but yeah, I don't know how to prove it, and if anyone can prove it or can help me prove it, that would be fantastic. There's probably much less of an issue if you're willing to do the Borel or Bernstein version, but you know, then you have to complete your external analysis, which you might not like. Okay, so uh, that's the end of my section on Sheaves of Spectra, and I realize that it's the end of the talk, um, which is perhaps unfortunate because, well, this was basically everything super concrete I had to say. Then I just had a list of observations and ideas. Um, one thing that I want to talk about is, well, I guess I, before I open up to questions, I have to say um, the reason why we can hope to do something meaningful by looking at the K-theoretic diet category is that even if we don't know right now how to construct perverse sheaves uh, or even how to define them, we definitely know how to define and construct parity sheaves. And that's just simply because KU is too periodic. Um, and has vanishing odd homotopy groups. So with that in hand, um, you know, there's sort of go going to be inevitably enough juice in the, uh, in the formalism of six functors to get a good handle on, on parity sheaves. And for many purposes, including hopefully for this geometric Satake statement, that will be enough. We won't even need to figure out what perverse sheaves are. Um, 
and you know there's there's actually already been some uh, some work done uh, by by myself and my collaborator uh, Spencer Leslie, where we worked with some other two periodic spectrum ring spectrum and and considered essentially what boils down to the you know the constructible derived category of sheaves of modules for that we considered parity sheaves there and proved some interesting things in representation theory so it seems like you know the same thing should basically work out with k theory as well um, and you know a bunch of other observations too but my my time is up so i'm going to see to questions or to organizers or to whatever is the protocol thank you very much gus so are there questions for gus i i guess i have a question about um why i mean if uh, if you're attempting to do um to answer the big question that you posed um why try geometric sataki first surely there would be easier um settings classic settings in geometric representation theory uh for instance the finite fake variety um to test out some of these ideas on first so i guess personally the reason is because you know i spent my entire grad school uh time working on geometric stacking, and this just felt very, very natural to me. Um, so that's the reason why I didn't do that. Now, the reason why um, maybe you shouldn't do that is I think that by now it's been done, um, at least in some sense. So there's a uh, work of Eberhardt. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm not sure if the category that he really worked with is phrased in terms of shoes of KV modules or whatever, but he, uh, you know, started with something from motives land and considered some, uh, to some, uh, to periodization of it, which ought to correspond, um, up, you know, up to some caveats with uh, and end up maybe only in some cases, whatever. But basically, you know, he's considered a category like like this and worked out what it looks like on flag varieties. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, I, I think Jordi can confirm if that is really true. Um, he's the one who ra who raised my awareness to it. Yes, I can confirm that that's really true. What you just said. It's not equivariant, um, which I guess is like the the big new thing. Like the, the technology to work in the non-equivariant case definitely exists. The technology that Eberhardt uses um, really com comes slightly more directly from like the, the motivic side of things, and I don't think. You know, I, th I think it would also be nice, even in a non equilibrium case, to um, have a slightly more analytic perspective on it. But yeah, the technology definitely exists and has been applied. Maybe I'll like only ask one more time. I promise. But like, you have this idea of the like Langlands, like the Langlands dual kind of game, and I think you, I think it might be in your next section, maybe. But like, can you tell me like what the Langlands dual of like SLN might be over KU? Like, is is this something you know? No, I haven't put much thought into exactly what it would be. Um, but I think that, like, I feel, you know, that, in, that when, you, when you have a um, functor of points description of an algebraic group in terms of, you know, endomorphisms and determinants and blah, 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 then I don't see why you why you shouldn't be able to at least define it on the level of functor of points on like the you know the category of K modules. So you know, or the the category sorry the category of K varieties. You know, uh, doesn't it make sense on to to consider the functor of points which sends a K variety to you know 
global sections of endomorphisms of the uh, trivial rank n vector model, and that would be GN, and then we could do a determinantal condition. It, these would at least be, you know, th this would give a function of points for like what the uh, what GLN or SLN or whatever should be in the K, where it, where it, you know, and don't say it's representable as a as an object in, as a variety as a you know KU scheme, but there's definitely a function of points, so we could at least think of it as a an object of you know stacks over KU schemes. Why not? And then that would be GLN um, or SLN or whatever have you, and uh, yeah, the actual statement where you don't have to write down you know functions on it which i think is what jordan was complaining about will just be that okay so it's some object in stacks on ku varieties um now that that infinity topos is uh being infinity topos it's powered over homotopy types so that means I can do things like internal home from S2. And that's, that's basically all you need for the statement. You would um, have some new stack internal home from S2 to this, this uh, stack I described. Classified. Well, I guess I didn't exactly describe point module, but once you've got a group stack, it shouldn't be that hard to, you know, quote, you can just do point mod and then you can. I mean, uh, just, just look at the statement that I've written here. If you believe you have some group stack G, then there should be no problem writing these statements down. Um, and you never need to say something like lift the algebra of functions on G to, um, to K. All you have to do is construct G as a stack. Um, so you just need a function of point. I think we know what they should be. Yeah, so that, that's the, I guess, I, there's also a typo here, there should be HD on the left to be consistent with my notation. I missed off a KU coefficient as well. But um, basically, yeah, it seems like something like that should be possible. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks everyone for coming and thank you especially to Gus for giving us this very, very nice talk. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. You know, it's been a real privilege. Thank you also very much to Jordi, I know, because you went some way out of your way, I think, to, uh, to have me here. And I really, really appreciate it. Thank, thank you very much, everybody.